one I I'm going to be fi partially finishing today is Rivet from the new Ratchet and Clank game, Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart. And she's trying very desperately to eat some pizza. And it's not going too well for her. But I'm really excited to draw this. I'm gonna, like, first draw and talk, I think, with a proper background going on. Um, So that's something, and that's gonna be really exciting to draw. And I just thought it'd be a great way to put the, the two... um topics together it's by having it all right so ratchet and clank rift apart is a, is a 3d platformer it's also a third person shooter much like any other ratchet and clank game and i love 3d platformers and ratchet and clank is one of my favorite 3d platformers I like 3D platformers that kind of incorporate a bit of something else. So Ratchet and Clank, of course, is, is a shooter as well as a 3D platformer. Um, something like Sly Raccoon, which is another one of my childhood favourites, Sly Cooper. Um, incorporates elements of stealth into it. Now, not... It's not a lot of stealth, it's obviously kind of superficial, but just the superficiality along with the platforming, the precise inputs, actually makes something that's really interesting. I really, I really like that, I like, I like platformers with a bit of um, something else going on, which is kind of weird to say because Doom, Doom Eternal is kind of a 3D platformer now. I didn't think I'd be talking about this, but it is. It has platforming segments in it, and they and they work really well. So when I was playing Doom Eternal um recently, it reminded me so much of Ratchet because a lot of Ratchet was um you know you'd be platforming, and then you would have like little battles, little gunfights interspersed with that. Which is kind of exactly what Doom Eternal's going for, which is very strange. Of course, Ratchet is usually fighting um, Dr. Nefarious's goons, Thugs for Less, or Tyranoids, stuff like that. And Doom Guy is fighting demons, but... You know, it's weird that they have such similar gameplay loops. It's very weird. Another thing I noticed about the Rift Apart trailer is, like, it seems to me, and now it might not be, but it, it looks like it's the first Ratchet and Clank game that will have, like... Because, you know, in other shooters, in other shooters, the more you shoot a gun, the less accurate it gets. Right? And it shows that because, like, you know, like, the scope, it goes, it goes out and... You know what I mean? Like, it gets less accurate. And they show that visually. It seems like it's the first Ratchet and Clank game to incorporate that. Which is very strange to me, because, like... Gunplay in Ratchet has always been kind of more about dodging and using the right gun at the right time rather than necessarily being amazing at aiming especially in the first two games like you could strafe but you couldn't really aim like you you could you could go into this mode where you could aim precisely but like you wouldn't be able to move around i think in the third game there's like they have like this third person camera that's a bit better but I'm not sure now. It's going to be super interesting to see that in a Ratchet game. But I wanted to I wanted to talk about how 3D platformers have kind of developed. Cuz we had we had Spyro, we had Crash, Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter, Slaracoon, Rayman, 
Jet Set Radio. You know, this was in the 90s and early 2000s. Late 90s, early 2000s. But then the 7th generation of consoles came along. Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Nintendo Wii. And stuff started to slow down. We still got a bunch of Ratchet games, but a lot of the other series kind of died out. Like Sly Raccoon only got one game on the PS3. And then the 8th generation, everything kind of seemed just well and truly dead. It was very sad to see because um, Crash Bandicoot had a bunch of weird um, games on the the PS2. Spyro had a bunch of weird games on the PS2. Then on the PS3, there was just nothing. It was Ratchet and, Ratchet and Clank was still get, making games, but it was just... It was basically just done. Like, I think there were still Mario games coming out. And of course, Mario was like the 3D platformer now. There's still Mario games coming out. Still 3D Mario games coming out that are decent. But, like, the, the genre seemed kind of in jeopardy. But then the turning point for me, really, was when the Insane Trilogy came out, right? Because that did really, really well. Like, it was a proper reboot, proper remake of the original Tree games, and then they did the same for the Tree Spiral games, which was very fascinating to me. I still think I prefer the original Spiral games, but I'm just glad, like, a new generation can enjoy them can enjoy the remakes and then in 2016 we had the reimagining of the first ratchet game now this was both bad and good because it was like it was the first ratchet game in a very long time the first proper ratchet game in a very long time but it was also just not very good there was a film released alongside it that wasn't very good it just, it didn't seem, like, as a fan of the series, it just didn't seem any good, like, and it wasn't even an original thing. It was a, it was a reimagining, and it just, it just, it got some bad reviews as well. It just wasn't what I wanted from Ratchet. I, I was happy to see, like, the series was still alive to some extent, but it just wasn't what i wanted from ratchet and clank but then in 2017 we had two new platformers come out and not only because this this is the upsetting thing about platformers they've mostly been relegated to console gaming and pc gaming i started i started getting into pc gaming but there's just, just just no platformers. There were so few platformers. Um, one platformer I did play that was a bit of a, a bit of a Ratchet and Clank clone was Skylar and Pluck's Adventure on Clover Island. And I'm actually, I'm actually gonna put, hopefully, I remember to do this. I'm gonna put Skylar from Skylar and Pluck's on the screen and Rivet from the new Ratchet game on the screen. They look. They look a bit similar, and it's a very interesting because that was meant to be kind of a Ratchet clone, and I played it, and it, it plays like a Ratchet and Clank game, basically. Like, there's not, there's not really any guns, but there's like gadgets, and there's interesting mechanics, and there's a jetpack that kind of functions like Clank. It kind of functions like a Ratchet game in a lot of respects. It's very interesting that, like, Skylar kind of, um, predicted Rivet, in a way. Alright, so then in 2017, we had Hat and Time and Ukulele. Um, Ukulele got mixed reviews. I've played a bit of Ukulele. I've played a bit of Hat and Time. I like both of them. I haven't finished either of them. 
but I remember um, I enjoyed both of them. I enjoyed playing both of them. So that was like a huge change just to have these two platformers come out in one year and then we have Reignited Trilogy and Insane Trilogy. Like that makes it feel like the genre is going to be alive and then the new ra Ratchet game of course here in 2021 and also there's another um, new franchise coming out called Clive and Wrench and as the name probably can tell you Clive and Wrench is very much rooted in that traditional you know treaty platformer like mascot sort of treaty platformer kind of thing and I love I love the animation it looks great I hope it will be good it's coming out this year the devs keep moving back the release date I so I hope it comes out this year it will be well I mean if they need more time to work on the game that's grand but I'm just hoping that it comes out soon enough that I can enjoy it I just really want to play it <laughs> looks awesome and it's just nice to have more platformers on the PC because you can you can connect a nice controller, a nice controller to your PC and you can play a platformer with a controller and it feels good, you know? And that's really easy to do these days. There's no reason why we can't have platformers on the PC. I'd love to see some of the Sony properties. I'd love to see Ratchet and Clank, Jack and Daxter and stuff like that come to PC, because why not? I'm really sick of console exclusives. There's no reason they can't be on PC. Happy with how the strong's gone. She has quite a look of consternation, as I desired. There are a few things. So, like, this all sounds really good, but are there anything, is there anything that makes me feel worried for the future of platformers there absolutely is um so crash 4 like not only did we have crash and insane trilogy but we also had a sequel to the trilogy called crash 4 made by the studio toys for bob Publisher Activision and I haven't played Crash 4 I really want to it's out on PC now um, the only thing that I'm not too sure about the PC release is that it came out with always online so I just need to I need to double check that because I'm not sure if that's still the case that's always online but it doesn't make sense for a single player game like Crash 4 it seems quite annoying actually so they did crash for it looks amazing it looks like an amazing game and I'm very excited to play it it's getting good reviews but toys for Bob you might have heard in the news they've been slated to work on Call of Duty Activision said hey you guys need to work on Call of Duty now Loads of people have been like, oh no, Activision's killing the studio. They're doing what EA did to Maxis. And I'm a little bit skeptical. I'm hoping that this is just temporary. Maybe they need more devs. They, you know, because that's, that's the game industry, you know, it's all crunch and all that. Maybe they just need more hands on deck for that game for the moment. But it is a bit worrisome because they made a beautiful platforming game and now they're slated to work on Call of Duty, which I mean, no offence to Call of Duty, I'm sure Call of Duty's grand, but like Call of Duty, uh, Call of Duty doesn't seem to me like it's going to die anytime soon. Call of Duty is not on life support, nor is 
um, first person shooters in general. But 3D platformers are on life support. And so that's kind of like taking a bit of that life support away and giving it to something else. Now, it's just it might just be temporary, it might just be grand. There's also been rumours of layoffs, which not EA, freaking Activision came out and said, oh no, no, that's, that's not what's going on. And hopefully that they're telling the truth on that. But 3D platformers are on life support and it's it's scary. I don't want this this genre to fade away. I love it. I love 3D platformers. Another thing in the in the 3G 3D platformer arena is this new game called Balan Wonderland. So <laughs> me and my boyfriend, we were just kind of looking at what whatever was new on Steam one night and we saw like because I didn't know about Balan Wonderland and we saw that and we were like hey this looks interesting we'll give it a go because there was a demo and it was it was just awful like it just wasn't a good game um we both had a go of it, it just it wasn't good there wasn't a lot of movement options when you like the game kind of functions off of the idea of um, like power ups being your life and so you get a power up and the power up would let you jump the power up would let you spit like balls of flames but if you get hit that power up's gone away you get downgraded back to the um, the normal character so we played we played Battle in Wonderland and it just it wasn't any good there was also this very strange section with um, poorly executed quick time events. It isn't... I love 3D platformers, so when I got into it and I saw that I was kind of a 3D platformer, I was like, oh man, this is awesome, I hope this game's good. I'll, I'll say the animation is good, you know, there's some really nice pre-rendered cutscenes in it. I like how the world's kind of unfold before your eyes as well that's another another thing that's really interesting about it like there's obviously potential there but that demo just wasn't good and it got a lot of bad reviews now i did some research on balan wonderland and many people were really hyped for balan wonderland because it was made by Yuji Naka, and I hope I'm saying that right, and he's the lad that's behind Sonic the Hedgehog, Nights into Dreams and stuff like that. So, of course you're going to be excited for the new game by the lad that made Sonic the freaking Hedgehog, but it just, it doesn't live up to the hype. And it was actually so bad. It was so bad. Like, I don't think I'm getting across how bad it was. It was like playing a shovelware game from the PS2 era. It was like playing an awful PS2 movie tie-in shovelware game. That's what playing it felt like. And it was very, very upsetting to see that. Now... I hope this doesn't sound too doomsday-ish, but like, I played that and I was like, this, you know, platformers are on life support, and the life support is Crash 4, the life support is Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, Hat and Time, that's the life support, and it's like, Balan Wonderland comes in to where platformers on life support and he pulls out the IV Balan Wonderland man with the, the big hat that lad that's what playing it felt like to me and it's just awful like now I I was gonna say the platforming genre is a hardy genre like 
We've been through this before. We've had many shovelware games. Many shovelware 3D platformers that just sucked. And we've managed to survive. But have we? Like, I think there was a reason nobody wanted to play platformers on the PS4, you know? Like, we forgot. We forgot about the shovelware. The really bad shovelware platformers that turned everyone off the genre. And now we got a new generation that's never experienced that. And they're playing, you know, Crash Reignited Trilogy. Not that, Spyro Reignited Trilogy. They're playing Spyro Reignited Trilogy, Crash Insane Trilogy. And they're like, this is wonderful. I want more of this. And then, then they'll play Battle in Wonderland and they'll be like, oh, actually, it's not great, is it? You know, so that's, that's the real thing that worries me. You know, like, because... You know, can I don't think platformers can survive that. They can't survive bad games. You know, they they don't have the hardiness to survive bad games right now. They they need all the help they can get, all the prayers they can get. Another honorable mention I should talk about here. I didn't think about this when I was thinking about what I should say during this episode, but I want to give a shout out to there's some there's some weird innovative kind of 3d platformers that have come out that aren't like the traditional 3d platformer one of them is human fall flat and the other one is snake pass both of those innovated like, I'm sure other games have done this as well, but these are the two I've played. Both of them kind of use physics in a really interesting way. The boat kind of physics-based platformers in a way. And it's very interesting to see that take place. Human Fall Flat uses it for a comedic effect. And Snake Pass uses it to kind of turn basic platforming into more of a puzzle. I wouldn't call it a puzzle game. There's puzzles in it, but I wouldn't call it a puzzle game. But you have to have this kind of lateral, sort of spatial sort of thinking to to get into Snake Pass and to like do challenges in Snake Pass and stuff that in a normal platform would come to you really easily. In Snake Pass, it's like you have to kind of go out of your way to do it. Those are really interesting. And I'm really happy that they exist. And I love seeing this genre existing. And I really hope, you know, Bad and Wonderland doesn't kill it. That'd be really nice. Okay, so we're like, we're finished the section on 3D platformers. And I'm about to start talking a little bit about pizza and just during this this midsection i'd just like to say if you enjoy this show please like you know show it do some engagement get the youtube algorithm going right get it going like the video subscribe do a comment i don't want to do this for money um I do this in my free time and I really love doing it and I want to keep doing it and the thing that will help me because I struggle with mental mental health stuff I struggle with that and I've already c came close to just not doing an episode some week so it get an engagement and it reaching people that enjoy it is very important to the continued existence of draw and talk it's very important to me because I just want to I want to meet people that enjoy it and you know that's, that's what I really want I want to build a community around it so liking commenting subscribing sharing it to a friend if you have a friend that you think would like it share it to them that mean a lot to me um, join the discord 
An interesting segue to be talking about with Ratchet and Clank and Pizza that I almost forgot about is... There was this animated short that just came out of seemingly nowhere called Ratchet and Clank Life of Pi. Now I haven't watched it because it's apparently very bad. It's apparently really bad so I haven't watched it. I might watch it anyways. But I haven't watched it yet. It's like a 20 minute short called Life of Pi and I think it's about Ratchet and Clank going out of their way to have some pizza like they steal it off dr nefarious or something i think that's what it's about and that's really weird because maybe that subconsciously influenced me to make this episode i mean it's possible i mean it's, it's rushing flank it's not rivet but i want to draw a rivet because you know she's the shiny new lombax which maybe I should do an episode on Ratchet and Clank lore. Let me know if you'd like that. I love talking about the Lombaxes and stuff like that. So anyways, just have some engagement with the video. Give me tips on how to improve the video, how to improve the audio. Give me feedback on what you like and what you don't like. That's very helpful to me. All right, now I'm gonna be talking a little bit about pizza because I did a lot of research because I tried to get a hot take on pizza. And I think I have a few interesting things to say about pizza. But first we need to delve into the history of pizza to give some context. Now pizza has existed like basically since bread has existed. And pizza in Italy, you know, you know, that existed for a very long time. But before it became the pizza margarita, as we know it today, it was seen as a peasant's dish. It was seen for poor people. It would have toppings like oil, tomatoes, fish. So that would be the early pizza that poor people would eat and they'd kind of kind of the idea of pizza is kind of new in the dough sort of the bowl for the the pizzas to be in and now this is the thing is what i'm gonna i'm gonna say what the, the supposed origin of modern pizza is but I don't know if this is actually true. This is what people say happened. I don't know if it's actually true, but this is like the word of mouth thing that people say made pizza happen. So, June 11, June 11th, 1889, Neapolitan pizza maker, now, I hope I don't say his name wrong. Raphael Esposito. Esposito. See, I'm not Italian. I can't say that. Alright, he created the pizza margarita. So that's the first modern pizza with tomatoes, mozzarella and basil. And the colours, those are supposed to honour the flag of Italy. And... He made this for to honor the the Queen Consort of Italy, which is interesting. So he took, so basically what he did is he took something that's for poor people and he made it sort of more extravagant. At least that's what I think kind of happened there. So then we get. Like, now we're going to talk about a bit about, like, because pizza comes from Italy. But how did pizza become worldwide? I think the only thing that really explains that is, like, the Americanization of pizza. And there's loads of different ways people say pizza came to America. Um, but the two main things that people 
bring up is that like Italian immigrants, they'd come over and they want to make a taste of home. Or World War II soldiers, they would be stationed in Italy, Naples, and they'd fall in love with the local pizza. And when they came home, they wanted to have a taste of that. So that's what people say brought pizza over to America. And now, of course, American pizza became its whole other thing. And it probably became so popular because it was simple, flexible, affordable. It, it's just very easily made into fast food. And I'm going to explain how American pizza is different than Italian pizza. It's, Italian pizza is, is much healthier. I'm not gonna say I'm not gonna say it's healthy though, because obviously like white flour and cheese is not necessarily healthy, but it's definitely more healthy than what we'd get over here in Ireland or America. Alright, so American pizza has vegetable oil or shortening mixed into the dough. Italian recipes usually call for San Marzano tomatoes, sometimes on their own, maybe a bit of oil and seasoning, not cooked, sauce in American pizzas, that's often cooked or processed. Both American and Ital Italian pizza call for mozzarella cheese, but there is often less cheese news than Italian pizza. It's kind of conservative. In Italian pizza usually and I also found some cases of American pizza chains would not just use mo mozzarella but they put in Munster cheese Munster cheese Little Caesars does that they mix in Munster cheese with the mozzarella to make it cheaper and another interesting little tidbit I found out is that pepperoni does not actually exists in Italy in in Italy pepperoni means like peppers like bell peppers it is an American thing like if you like I saw people because I saw I looked at a bunch of Italian people talking about pizza and they were all like oh well if you ask for pepperoni pizza in Italy you get a freaking pizza covered in bell peppers and I think that's really interesting because um you know I'm I'm vegetarian I don't like pepperoni pizza well I just I don't eat it I'm sure I'd like it if there was a, a vegetarian friendly version so sometimes I'd order a pizza with jalapeno peppers on it and this has happened to me at least three times, which isn't a lot, because I, I get a lot of pizza. I really like pizza. It's happened at least three times where they would get confused and they'd give me pepperoni on it instead. So I'm wondering, is there any sort of relation to that? Like, it's the opposite, like, you know, they're like, the opposite of what hap would happen in Italy. Now, of course, in Italy, they do have stuff that's kind of like pepperoni on pizza. They got, like, salami on pizza. But pepperoni itself, that's an American thing. You can't get pepperoni pizza. Pepperoni, which... I've seen people describe pepperoni as being a sort of, like mystery meat salami like i don't even know what salami is i'm vegetarian don't know what it tastes like i've had pepperoni before before i was vegetarian never had salami or anything like that but i have to talk a bit about meat in order to talk about pizza because that's a big part of it for some people 
But that's another thing that's amazing about pizza. Pizza's great for vegetarians and even vegans because, like, you can kind of just put whatever you want on it. It's kind of, like, every pizza place does a, oh, what do you want on your pizza? Pick your own pizza. You can just do that. You can say, I want this topping, I want that topping. Pizza is, like, the most customizable food, and that's another thing that I love about it. And it's another thing that makes it good for vegetarians like me. It's like, I don't have to get meat on it. Like, from ordering from the Chinese or something. The Chinese takeaway. Some places are good and they let you choose what you want in your sort of... Your sort of wok, I guess. Sort of stir fry kind of things they do. But some places they don't really let you do that and they just kind of chuck whatever in and it's usually meat just a lot of meat and that kind of sucks i would love there to be more customizability i'm gonna talk a little bit because i'm gonna talk a bit about what pizza is like in ireland now ireland just like every other place probably has its own specialty specialty probably has its own specialty pizza joints that you go in and they cook beautiful gorgeous pizza and they give it to you it's lovely and they're trying to cook it like they do in italy and it's gorgeous i know there's places like that because i looked it up and there is places like that that said haven't been to those places at least not a lot my first exposure to a pizza that I really liked was in Spain. And I believe that's because every pizza I had before then was a frozen pizza. Every, every pizza I had before then. The leading brand is called... The leading brand that introduced Ireland to pizza... Is, is a brand called Goodfellas. And Goodfellas, they sell Americanized pizza to Irish people. Americanized frozen pizza is the leading brand in Ireland. So, what I would have had was probably Goodfellas pizzas or maybe Dr. Oker pizzas. And I remember I didn't really like pizza that much. Because all I had was frozen pizzas. So I went to I went to Spain like you do when you're a kid and you're going on holidays and you're an Irish kid, you're going on holidays, you go to Spain, you go to Portugal. So we were in Spain. And there was this, this pizza place. I don't remember what it was called. I think they had like this little logo with like a bull on it maybe. So I remember me and my sister going to this pizza place. And we were like queuing up. And my sister chose the pizza. And what she chose was a spicy pizza. It was just kind of a plain margarita pizza. But it had like herbs on it and like little bits of chili peppers like baked into the dough. No, not the dough, like the, the cheese itself. It was baked into the cheese itself. And so we went so we went into this this pizza place, got this pizza and so what we did is she brought it back to the hotel, our hotel under her arm so the pizza box would be sideways it was under her arms sideways slanted which is not how you should ever hold a pizza box of course so we got back to the hotel we opened the lid and it was all messed up because of the way she was holding it like the cheese was all going off it um Every, it was just everywhere um it was just it was destroyed because like 
But Jesus, just it's just off it. It was like it was touching everywhere in the in the cardboard box. And I think, I think that was a blessing in disguise because what happened is I think she only ended up eating a very small bit of it, and then she gave the rest to me to eat. Like I was gonna have some anyways, but like she, like I didn't just get a slice. Like she gave like almost the whole pizza to me because of the way it got messed up and it was one of the most delicious things i ate and you know like when you eat food like usually people these days they eat food while watching tv or youtube or you know they do something while they eat all i did was eat this pizza i wasn't watching anything I wasn't doing anything else, like, it was an exercise in mindfulness. I was on the balcony of this hotel room, and it was late at night, and I was so focused on consuming this pizza. Big reason why I was so focused is because it was the first time that I've really had spicy food, and I was just in love with it. It was so delicious, and I really... From that point onward, I really like spicy food. So it wasn't just an introduction to what a good pizza can taste like. It was an introduction to spicy food. So I very mindfully consumed the entire pizza that we got in Spain. And then, um, later on in the holiday, we got another pizza from there, but we didn't repeat the same mistake. And we had, I got to see what the pizza looked like, um, before it gets destroyed. And it just, it just looked really nice. It was so beautiful looking. Like, I remember, you know, the chilies, they were red and they were like perfectly cut. And the mozzarella, it was like, it was so white i guess it was you know it wasn't like what the what i get over here it's, it was just it was really nice and what i've done is for the rest of my life i've been trying to recreate that pizza i've had in spain to some success um with like takeout pizza that we can get over here in ireland did some research to see if the pizza I had in Spain would be more authentic to like Italian pizza than the pizza I have at home. So what I learned about the history of pizza in Spain is that Italian immigrants would come to Spain and especially in the remote sort of countryside homes they would have spanish homes would have these traditional wood-fired bread ovens and it would be very similar to a pizza oven so i found out that early italian immigrants to spain they would have the equipment there to to cook pizzas like they did back home and that makes me think that maybe, like, in Spain, you're probably getting a better pizza than you would over here in Ireland. Because I don't think there's any history. I, I don't think Italians have ever really emigrated to Ireland. But apparently they have, like, I'm sure, no, I'm sure there's Italians that have come to Ireland and emigrated to Ireland. But, like, mass emigration, I don't. You know, I don't think so. Not that I know of. I mean, Ireland... It's only really recently that Ireland has become a place where you can emigrate to. And even then, like, many Irish people still immigrate. You know, we are... We are a nation... Of emigrants, right? Irish people have gone... all all over to Australia, like England, America. Irish people, like, there's a very interesting and very sad history 
if you want to look it up about what they called the coffin ships and that is like what the kind of the sadness and the sort of the desperation of Irish emigration and that's why Irish people like were a very small country country of only like four million people but we have a huge cultural effect on the rest of the world because so many people all over the world have Irish heritage but yeah I'm getting I'm getting ahead of myself there that's a bit of a tangent but basically what I'm trying to say is like the Spanish pizza was much better than anything I've ever had and the more I learn about the way pizza is made in Ireland because Ireland is another thing about Ireland we don't have any sort of food culture like we basically like Irish people like like we have some things that are like kind of Irish like we have we have fish and chips we have tea but even the English are doing that. Like, the English have made that their thing, so that can't even be our thing. <laughs> we don't have a food culture the same way the Italians do. And let me tell you, when I was doing research for this, the Italians have, like, perhaps the most... What would I say? the most like extravagant maybe the most to be respected i'd say food culture that i've ever read about right these people they take their food very seriously they take the recipes very seriously and i mean it's no surprise that like any any culture is going to be a bit upset when someone takes their food and they kind of do it wrong but wrong in their eyes, whatever, like, doing it different. But Italians, like, this is baked into them from day one. Not, no pun intended. <laughs> that, like, they gotta have this respect for food that, like, I just don't see many, like, like, I don't see English people have, definitely don't see Irish people have, don't see... Like, Americans kind of do have a food culture, that, which is really interesting. Because it's kind of just based, like... American food culture seems to be like a bit of everything, which is really cool. They also kind of have a bit of a fast food culture, though. Ireland's kind of going down that route as well, because we kind of have, like, a takeaway culture. And I have, on many occasions, called my town the takeaway capital of Ireland. Because we just have so many takeaways. Like, there's so much choice of takeaway. But, like, good luck finding a nice restaurant. <laughs> we actually do have some nice restaurants, but, like, not as many as, like, just the takeaways you can get. So, Italian people, they have this huge respect for food and how they make it and it's like almost a religious thing I've seen some of them describe it as and we're going to talk a little bit more about that sort of culture in a bit but I want to I want to talk a little bit about just a little tiny bit more about about how Ireland has like Ireland only has, like, popularised, like, 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 I'm sure we do have Italian sort of places to get pizza, but Ireland has gotten on the American pizza bandwagon. And I hope it's not coming off as, like, I'm saying American pizza's bad, because it's not. I have American pizza, like, almost every week. I love it delicious tasty but also 
I'd love to be able to to just have the real thing. <laughs> Not even the real thing. The the original thing, I'd say. I'd love to be able to have the original thing in a more easily accessible way. So now here's the weird here's another weird thing. Ireland has this pizza place called Apache Pizza. And if you've never heard it heard of Apache Pizza before, you're probably going like that, like what Apache? You mean you mean the First Nation tribe from America? And it's like, yes. They they've named uh, a pizza place in Ireland after a Native American tribe in America. I guess in America it was a bit redundant there, but you get what I'm saying. They've named it after that. And it's a bit of an embarrassment. It's a bit of an embarrassment that, because Apache Pizza is the biggest, biggest, like, pizza place in Ireland, right? It's the biggest pizza franchise in Ireland for a takeaway and sit-in sort of fast food American pizza that you can get. Um, it's nice. It's nicer than Domino's Pizza, at least. It's, it's decent. I really like Apache Pizza, but they have a weird, a weird cultural appropriation thing going on. And I think they only really get away with it because it's Ireland. Because we're such a small country. You know, maybe they probably wouldn't get away with it in England just because it's a bigger country with more people to kind of see that but that doesn't mean that there hasn't just because like there hasn't been a new jail roar doesn't mean that there isn't people talking about it there is what's it called again there's a group on facebook um i believe it's it's ran by Native Americans and might even be ran by people from the Apache tribe itself, but like it's called Apache Pizza Resistance. It doesn't it's not a very nuge it's not a nuge thing, but like they're trying to say Apache Pizza, you freaking can't be using our name for your pizza. That's offensive, that's culturally appropriative, it doesn't make sense. I looked up, I actually looked this up, because I wanted to see if, if, is there some rich sort of Native American history with pizza that I've just never found out before. I looked it up and there doesn't really, like, on the internet there doesn't seem to be any sort of mention of Native American tribes um, having pizza before they were colonized. So Apache pizza is just kinda it's just it just has that aesthetic because they wanna they want people to think of America, which is so interesting. I wanna let's think about just think about the weird like kinda multicultural identity of pizza here. It is an Irish-owned restaurant selling Americanized Italian food with a Native American aesthetic going on. When I say there's a Native American aesthetic, I mean it like they got like... Like, they used to lean into it a lot more. I think they used to have... Um, they, on the boxes, I think there used to be like this sort of picture of like someone in a war bonnet on the boxes now it's a picture of like some buffalo running through a sort of stylized desert so i think they're kind of trying to dial back on that a bit but in the restaurant itself it's like even worse because they have like these pictures of 
on the wall on the wall of the restaurant they have pictures of like people from native american tribes on the wall in black and white like and i don't know if that's because they've stylized them that way or if that's how they were taken but the few times i've been in a restaurant some restaurants have that kind of thing going on some don't i've been in a couple of them i think they only get away with it because it's ireland and i don't think they should because it is an embarrassment like think of it this way like someone could be coming over from america coming to ireland right ireland one of the countries in europe that doesn't have like colonialist baggage going on probably thinking oh ireland this would be a lovely place for me to go like and this has actually happened i actually read a blog post of a of a native american person coming over and getting so excited to come to ireland and they were like apache pizza what what's this doing over here in, in ireland i thought i thought this wouldn't be in ireland you know and that's sad that's a bit of an embarrassment now apache pizzas their the pizzas are nice they're nice pizzas i like them but you know it's really it's really sad that like they haven't changed it. i don't know what they would change it to maybe they would lean more into the cowboy sec because they have like their tagline is too many cowboys just want apache so i guess the idea is that they're feeding the cowboys which i don't want to read into that too much because i'm sure like i'd come up with something that's very horrifying but maybe they can they can get rid of the name apache and they can be they can call it cowboy carousel or something you know just be just be cowboy team come on everyone likes cowboys you know and then you'd have the cultural appropriation out of the way except you might be culturally appropriating cowboys themselves which like if somebody gets mad at that who cares <laughs> They can get mad at that, you know, it's not, it's not really the same thing. But yeah, that's, that's the thing about Apache Pizza, a really nice pizza place that I'd recommend you try, but it has weird cultural appropriation going on on their pizzas. That is a bit of an embarrassment to Ireland, so please stop. Please stop, Apache. Change your name. I like your pizzas, but I don't like your name, slash a sec. So, we're gonna talk a bit more about Italian food culture. Because I talked about how Ireland... In Ireland, the pizza you're getting is Goodfellas and Apache Pizza. In Italy, they have... Everyone's making their own pizza. And you can get a nice, delicious local pizza very easily. And one thing I was awestruck at is, like... Italian people just have an utter, innate distaste for corporations coming into Italy and trying to sell their own versions of Italian food. So we're going to go off a pizza for a bit and we're going to talk about coffee. Because coffee is like a ritual in Italy. And I didn't know this, but they have like these stand-up espresso bars. And someone would like come in to these espresso bars you know, they wouldn't sit down, they'd have like a little cup of espresso and they'd drink that and they'd be on their way. And another thing that they tend to do is that they will like pay it forward, they will pay for a bit of an espresso, and they'd leave that there for the next person that comes. So it would be like it's just it's a very interesting cultural thing and it's very different than like how you would consume coffee in like 
and they just take great pride in it now i'm i'm the type of person that when i do have coffee i have like instant coffee with freaking you know freaking stevia or something in it you know i try to be healthy Tried to be healthy and lazy, but to some people, this is like a way of life. So, there was like a new upheaval in Italy when they opened the very first Starbucks in Italy in 2018 in Milan. Now, Howard Schultz, now I don't think I'm pronouncing that right, I'm sorry. But he's like, he's the man that was responsible for modern Starbucks co coffee. And because Starbucks, they used to just sell coffee beans. And he turned Starbucks into a coffee shop selling espresso based drinks. And he did this because he went to Milan himself and... He was very inspired by the, the stand-up espresso bars. So it's so funny that, like, he goes... He goes and... He builds the, the most beautiful, like, opulent Starbucks I've ever seen. It's a beautiful building. The the Milan Reserve Roastery, it's called. It's a beautiful building. It's just gorgeous looking. It's nude. Um, it's like a museum of coffee. The interior is nude. There's beans grinding in the very center. Giving guests like a little look into how the coffee is made. And despite that, Italians hate it. Like, I'm sure there's some that like it. Like, I'm sure there's some that's like, oh, Starbucks, that's grand. And they made such a really nice one just for us as well. That's lovely. But some people were still so mad about it because of that culture they have. And I wanna, I wanna compare this with how Starbucks is in Ireland. I wanna compare this with a terrible date I went on. Now I'm calling it a date. I didn't feel like it was a date. I'm not sure if the guy I was with felt like it was a date. We were just friends, but I think he was kind of treating it like one. But it was very, it was very upsetting how it happened. And Starbucks was a huge part of it. So, we're there, like, we're there by the, in the centre of Dublin, by the River Liffey. And he turns to me and he says, do you want, do you want cheap, I think he said, do you want cheap coffee or do you want fast coffee? And I thought about it for a bit and I was like, oh yeah, I'd want cheap coffee. So he takes me to the Starbucks. It's a very, it's a tiny Starbucks on one side, on one side of the Liffey, and he's, and there's like a really long queue, there's nowhere to sit down, there's a little place to like put your sugar and stuff into the coffee, but there's like nowhere to sit down. So he takes me in there and he's like, oh yeah, well on this side of the Liffey, because of regulations, the coffee is cheaper, and on the other side of the Liffey, um, the coffee is uh, more expensive. And that makes sense, but then, after waiting for ages in line and getting the coffee, he takes me to another Starbucks across, across the river, right? Across the bridge. He takes me to another Starbucks that's much bigger across the bridge. That's very unlike the little dingy Starbucks we went to. It's still not, it's still not like the Milan Reserve Roastery, okay? It's two stories, but like there's just, like in the story we went to, like it was just, oh, it was just, 
It was a bit of an uncomfortable situation. Claustrophobic, even though it was big, because there's loads of crowds of people there. And we we drank our takeaway coffee that we got from the Starbucks across the river in there. And I just think that's bizarre. I I I know he was trying to save me money. I know he was trying to, like, show me, uh, hey, um, like, I can save you money or whatever, but I wish he just told me what he, <laughs> what he was going to do, because that's just, um, very strange. I would have just preferred to pay for the expensive one and actually just sit in there instead of feeling kind of a bit like a criminal coming in with the Starbucks we got across the river. <laughs> like, it's just very odd, but like, that's Starbucks. That's my Starbucks experience in Ireland. And I don't know if what he was saying about one side of the river having more expensive coffee than the other side of the river. I don't know if that's true. But that's what he told me. So then we come back to the Milan Reserve Roastery. It's like the nicest Starbucks in the world. But people were still really mad that Starbucks was coming to Italy and people are people are still really mad about it and It doesn't matter how nice the place is. It uh, they want they want their food culture to be respected. And I think Starbucks tried their best. I think they were like, if we're gonna open in Italy, it has to be extravagant. It has to be the best freaking Starbucks in the world. But some other companies aren't like that. Domino's Pizza has announced that it's going to open 880 locations in Italy by 2030. Now, they already have a few places in Italy. And I've seen the pizza that comes out of there. And it looks nice, alright? It looks a lot nicer than the Domino's Pizza we'd get over here. I'm not saying it looks amazing. Or it looks like good proper Italian pizza, but it looks a lot nicer. Like the cheese just looks m better cooked. They even bother putting a stingy bit of basil in the middle of the margarita. You know, it just it looks better. So even Domino's, being the lazy people that they are even they bother to put on a little bit of basil for the italians but they're nothing like nothing like what starbucks did there's no way they'll get like acceptance with that carry on and that seems to be domino's policy now domino's like they're very they're a very successful company, but you can see that their policy of um oh we'll just go in here and we'll just do what we always do doesn't work because they tried to do that in China. Now in China pizza might be a bit of a hard sell because many people just in China just aren't into cheese. And so Domino's just came in and they were just offering the normal pizzas that they offer. Whereas Pizza Hut came in and they have like soy sauce pizzas, pizzas with chicken, tuna, crab sticks, corn. And they ended up having 
over a thousand three hundred stores in China. Domino's only has forty. So that's the kind of carry on that you can expect from Domino's, but you know, maybe there will be an American pizza provider that comes to Italy and makes Italians go, you know what, American pizza, not actually that bad, but I don't think so anytime soon. So that's really all my hot takes about pizza. Pizza's always been really important to me ever since I had that experience in Italy back when I was doing school work. School was really hard for me and I'd always look forward to Pizza Friday where I'd get a nice um, Pizza Hut pizza every every Friday and that would I would look forward to that because I'd have a hard week doing stuff at school and that would be kind of the way I'd say, good job, you made it through the school week. And then I've talked about it in other episodes, like you have your depression pizza and you have your happy pizza. And sometimes just what I need is like sharing pizza with someone and like just having a laugh. That's that's healing for me. So this is a really complicated drawing. It's much more complicated than the usual thing I draw and draw and talk. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna finish this drawing. It's probably gonna take me. Hmm. Let's think about it. Maybe another hour. Maybe another two hours to finish this drawing. I'm not sure. And I'll come back to you and you can see the finished drawing. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go overboard with the colours, I'm gonna go wild, it's gonna be a really nice drawing, I hope. So, I'll get back to you in a wee bit. And hello, I've finally finished the drawing, I've actually finished it on uh, Friday, so... This was so complicated that it took two days. Like, say it took maybe four hours, I don't know. So like two hours every day. I actually started this the sketch on Wednesday. I did the sketch on Wednesday. Um, then I did the line art on the Thursday, and here on the Friday I finished the colour room. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to upload this and start editing the video that you should be watching right now. I think it came out, I, I feel mixed results about how it, mixed feelings about the results. Like, like the lighting feels a bit more muddy than I than I'd want it to be. Some of the colors feel nice to me. Some of them don't. Um, but I'd say I'm overall happy. Like I wanna, I really wanna improve my art. I wanna start pushing it because I feel like if I really want this show to work, then the art has to be good. Um, well, it doesn't have to be good, but it being good won't hurt. And next week, I'm going to be talking about... I think I'm going to be talking about men's issues or men's mental health. Because that's really important to me. I don't know if it'll be next week. I might choose something else because I, I really want that episode when I make it to be really polished. I want to feel confident about what I'm saying. So I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing next week, but I'm sure it'll be something good. Thank you for watching, and remember to um, check out the Discord and all that good stuff.